Good afternoon, everyone. Before we begin, just a gentle reminder that all microphones are to be muted unless questions are to be asked. This is so as not to disrupt the event's proceedings. Please settle down and the event shall commence shortly. Please be informed that there will be a question and answer session at the end of the talk. You may submit your questions via the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Do include your name and state whether you would like to ask your question in person or have the host ask on your behalf. Good afternoon to Mr. Richard Wee, our guest speaker for today's dialogue session. Mr. Hamahaida Singh, Head of School of Taylor's Law School, lecturers, fellow students, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first dialogue session of the semester. My name is Tan Ijin and I shall be your MC for the day. To kickstart today's proceedings, we would like to invite Ms. Sarata, lecturer of Taylor's Law School, to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Richard Wee. Thank you so much, Eugene. Mr. Richard graduated with a Bachelor of Law from the University of London, and he completed CLP in 1998 and was admitted as an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya in 1999. He holds a certificate in strategic conflict management for professionals awarded by the Singapore Mediation Center, a certificate of attendance for the Asian Domain Main Dispute Resolution Center workshop awarded by the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center for Arbitration, now known as the Asian International Arbitration Center, and a certificate from the Southeast Asia Regional Anti-Doping Organization for Result Management for Anti-Doping. Mr. Richard obtained in 2016 the Certificate of Sports Arbitration from AIAC, a qualification which is a preparatory step towards appointment as a sports arbitrator. In 2019, FIFA and Football Association of Malaysia appointed Mr. Richard to the Appeals Committee of the National Dispute Resolution Chambers. Mr. Richard's portfolio includes matters of mergers, takeovers and acquisitions of companies, including property law and sports law. He is currently assisting the federal government on pro bono basis to offer advice and comments on the blueprint for eSports in Malaysia, engaged by a state government to draft enactments for stadium management, rules and regulations for eSports, and also engaged to assist a state government form a special e-sport tribunal. He co-founded the Sports Law Association of Malaysia in 2016, organized several annual sports law conferences, conducted many trainings and seminars all over Malaysia, and is an invited speaker at universities and colleges on the area of law, including our university for today. Richard uh, has featured on more than one occasion on Business FM radio to speak about amongst sports and e-sports matters. He has also appeared in international television giving interviews about his experience with Everton Football Club. Mr. Richard also has found time to pen a chapter about Malaysia's sport law for the International Encyclopedia of Sports Law, <clears throat> together with Dr. Zaidi Hashim, Leslie Lee, Safna Rafichandran, Brian Wu, and Vincent Lim. Richard co authored the state Malaysian chapter. At his previous firm, he, Mr. Richard, led his sports law practice group to win consecutive awards at the annual Asian Legal Business Malaysia Law Awards for the Sports Law Firm of the Year Award. Legal 500 has described him as an expert for sports law, while ALB in 2017 acknowledged Mr. Richard team at MWPA as a best boutique firm for sports law. Mr. Richard is also passionate about serving by and was the secretary of the Malaysian Bar Council from 2013 to 2015, he was an elected councillor of the Malaysian Bar Council from 2011 to 2016. He was also an elected member of Kuala Lumpur Bar Committee from 2005 to 2010. He continues to serve the bar as chairperson of the Professional Standards and Development Committee, which manages the bar's continuing professional development CPD scheme. Thank you very much for being with us today, Mr. Richard Lee. We will now present your talk. Uh, thank you so much, Shazza. Uh, um, it's very awkward to hear your own CV, especially from your profile written by somebody else. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, once again, thank you to Taylor's University for having me back. 
uh, I think we spoke a few months ago on uh, esports uh, at Taylor's University. And um, I know a few people in Taylor's myself. Um, and of course, I've known Taylor since you were just a, a college before you became a uh, university. So well done to Taylor's. Uh, for today's topic, uh, notwithstanding the, the constant mention of sports, 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 but uh, RWC is actually very much doing a lot of other things other than sports. Uh, the only reason why I think we are very popular for sports is because um, there are not many people doing it and we happen to be quite uh, active and aggressive about it and made us a little bit more well-known than the rest. Uh, I would dare say 20% of our law firm is about sports, uh, but the rest is about corporate law, company law, uh, our logistics. We do a lot of work for logistics. We do a lot of work for um, tourism and hospitality law. Uh, we have uh, deal, dealt with many company law disputes, contractual law, uh, etc., etc. So quite much wider than that. Um, but thank you for that kind introduction, which, um, uh, let's say, was uh, written by somebody else. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, this COVID-19 bill, um, a little bit too late issued by our parliament, by our government, but I suppose better late than never. Uh, the idea of the COVID-19 bill uh, is to address the change of human behavior over the last uh, five, six months due to the pandemic. Um, there is no doubt that uh, the way we have lived our life, the way we have, uh, I mean, just look at us now. In normal situation, I won't be speaking with you sitting from my table through this. I would have loved to meet all of you face to face, have my free te tare, because every talk we go to Malaysia, will come with a free te tare. Uh, and then, you know, uh, meet up with my friend, uh, Mr. Harmahinda, or even uh, Professor Kong Kok Wai, who is my classmate. So it would be nice to hang out in your lakeside uh, campus. But what to do? You know, change of behavior. I'm now meeting you from uh, the subtlety of my office, my domain. This is my room. You are looking at uh, my office room. So, um, and this change of behavior has now affected the way we do our business, our work, and has definitely affected a lot of legal uh, relationships. So, for example, uh, we have issues pertaining to contract limitation, consumer protection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this COVID nineteen bill, what uh, uh, RWC did, my, my firm did, was um, uh, four of our team members, uh, Wendy, Ian, uh, Ashley, and May Ping. Uh, Ashley and May Ping are interns, whereas uh, Wendy and Ian are pupils. They decided to draft an article uh, about the COVID nineteen bill, which I thought was a a very extensive bill written by four very, very young uh, uh, legal eagles. So if I can click to the next page of this uh, slide, um, please. Okay. Hold on, Richard. Thank Hold you, on, Sorry, yeah, I tell you. So, uh, thank you. So, uh, the topic is, of course, about legal impacts of the COVID-19. We have uh, listed down the 12 areas. So, if you are free, you can go to my law firm's website and you will see this article. It's called the COVID-19 Bill, the 12 Amendments. Um, it's very easy to spot because we put a picture of a, a mask over a building uh, which is quite apt in what's happening now. So these 12 amendments, uh, you can see from the screen, these are the six areas which we notice. Contract Limitation Act, Sabah and Sarawak Limitation Act, uh, PAPA 1948, the Insolvency Act and the High Purchase Act. Next page, you will see another six areas, uh, which is about um, the Consumer Protection Act, the Distress Act, Housing Developers Issues, the Employment Law Issues under Chapter 10, uh, the Public Transport Issues under Chapter 11, and the, the Courts, uh, the Rules in Courts under Chapter 12. So these are the 12 areas which we, we uh, compile. Actually, if you look at the, the bill itself, uh, if you look, if you peruse the bill, the bill has uh, a lot more than that. In fact, it's, uh, it's not even broken up to 12. It's, it's broken up to many, many, many sections. But uh, we, uh, we, when we were drafting the, the article uh, to ease the reader's view, because it was drafted meant for a reader when they read, they understand. Because reading this is confusing, this, uh, this bill. Um, so we then compiled it 12. So don't get confused. When you do peruse the bill and you peruse the article, you say, hey, 
The bill don't have 12. And that's because we compile it in 12 areas. Huh? Now, um, so for today's topic, uh, we have one hour. I will go through it very quickly. Um, I think the Q&A will be more uh, valuable. So uh, uh, we'll start off with the first uh, area, the first chapter that we, 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 we compile with, which is the uh, contracts. But before that, sorry, before that, some general observations about this uh, bill. When the bill is passed, uh, we hope Parliament will pass it, um, the bill will be retrospective. So we assume the bill will be passed this month in September and uh, it will go through the uh, Dewan Negara, uh, from Dewan Rakyat going to Dewan Negara, and eventually will reach uh, our young Pertuan Agong for the Royal Essen. And I, I reckon it should be ready by the end of the month. Um, so the first thing is that it will be retrospective. It will operate for two years. So this, this, this uh, Act of Parliament, when it becomes an Act of Parliament, it will operate for two years. And apparently it will prevail Every other bill, every other law. So if there's an inconsistency, this bill will prevail. Uh, and this uh, bill can even be extended. Uh, the Prime Minister, whoever the Prime Minister at the time, um, <laughs> now Malaysia, we have no idea who's going to be the Prime Minister tomorrow. Uh, so whoever the Prime Minister at the time may extend the bill for another certain period. And uh, the extension must be done in Parliament. Um, of course, by then, it won't be a bill. It will be an act of parliament. It will be a statute. Next, please. So, um, thank you. Now, the first one we'll talk about is contract. So, long story short, basically, any contract uh, which during the period of 18 of March this year to 31st December this year, if there's any contract which has been, uh, there's a breach, you are unable to perform, uh, blah, 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 under the Contract Act. Because in Malaysia, the law of contract is governed by the Contract Act. Um, then, according to this Act of Parliament, this soon-to-be Act of Parliament, uh, that breach of contract will be waived. So it, it can be waived. So it's, uh, basically, it's okay to be a bad boy the next six, seven months. Um, or should I say nine months. Um, however, there is a proviso uh, if the contract has already been terminated, let's say someone breached a contract and um, parties terminated it in May 2020, three months ago, that contract cannot be revived. So you can't undo what has been done. So uh, that's why I said at the beginning of this talk that this Act of Parliament is a little bit late, uh, should have been given to us in March but uh, Parliament only came about now. Um, quite a poor effort by our current government. They should have done this much earlier. Uh, so by the time this bill comes into force, it'll be probably in October. So, uh, which means we only look at contracts which is going to be in breach from October, November, December. Uh, unless there was a breach of contract in April. But until now, Parties haven't terminated it yet. Then, that breach of the contract will be protected by this act. So the party who breached the contract can seek refuge under this provision. So you, want, you know what's the funny thing happening out there now? Everybody is busy terminating contract now before this bill comes into force. How silly of our parliament. So, uh, or should I say of our government? Because it's not parliament's fault. It's the current government who's presenting the bill. So, there you go. That, that's the first issue. The uh, uh, issues pertaining to the contract. Again, I said, uh, you want a more detailed reading, just go through our, our article. Uh, and I'm not the only one who wrote articles. You can look at Mr. Lee Shi's article uh, from the blog called The Malaysian Lawyer. Uh, and uh, I think a few other law firms, uh, even Nakis and Partners, wrote an article about this. You can also peruse that. Uh, I think you just Google uh, a few law firms wrote articles about this, not just RWC. Can? Can I go to number two, please? Um, oh, okay, still number one, sorry. So these are the categories of contract which will be governed under this uh, proviso. Uh, construction, performance bond, professional services like me, 
uh, event contracts, lease and tenancy, basically it's a rental agreement, tourism agreements, and religious and pilgrimage related agreement. So these are the contracts which we govern about this, which now creates a new conundrum. What are the what about contracts outside this? Like a shareholders agreement contract uh, or a sports contract. Uh, contract. Marriage contract. A marriage contract, yeah, someone said that. <laughs> so interesting, uh, uh, I guess for us lawyers, is for us to interpret in court later. Um, and I suppose some lawyers will be earning more legal fees doing this work. So well done to, to the parliament. Uh, but this is the categories of contract that will be covered under this provision. Next, please. Limitation Act. Now, number two and number three is actually all about Limitation Act. It's about the Sabah, Sarawak and Malaysia Limitation Act. So, what is a Limitation Act? For, for those of you young students who are listening to this for the first time, a Limitation Act is where you can sue somebody within a certain period of time, usually six years. So, in Malaysia, the Limitation uh, Laws are controlled by the Act of Parliament called the Limitation Act. So, the LA, we call it LA, uh, the LA 1950, um, usually uh, deals with contract and tort, and it says six years. What if your limitation period expired during the MCO and you were unable to file a suit because the courts were closed, your lawyer can't work, you can't file, e-filing is down, etc. is down. So according to this uh, new pro uh, provision, the new chapter in this uh, COVID-19 bill, uh, your date action is revived. So this one, uh, what a, a, a Malaysian Malay will say, Mati Hirok Semula. You know, your date come back alive. Uh, Mati Hirok Semula. So uh, some of my clients, uh, I think they are very happy about this because I think some of them have tried to sue somebody but couldn't sue because the limitation period fell within this time. So this is quite a, this is a good proviso to have. A bit late, but good proviso. So the next page, uh, number three, the, the same thing applies in Sabah and Sarawak. So this proviso apply in Malaya, Sabah and Sarawak. Okay, all three uh, major states in Malay, uh, Malaysia. Um, next, please. Now, what is Public Authority Protection Act 1948? PAPA. You must take note that PAPA was uh, passed before Malaysia was, Malaya was formed in 1957. It's a very old Act of Parliament. So the PAPA Act actually deals with any lawsuit against public authorities. So if you want to sue a government agency, your uh, limitation period uh, is about six months to 36 months. So the law actually limits the time period for us to file any suit against a government public authority. But however, uh, based on this uh, COVID-19 bill, the PAPA has been uh, 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 tweaked and basically now the period has been extended. So if you look at it, uh, in our article, uh, you can now sue outside uh, 18 of March to 31st December. Now you realize by now, all the time period that the, 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 the parliament is dealing with is what happens between 18 of March to 31st December. And we all know on 18 of March, all of us were housed in prison. The government announced all of us cannot go out. So for the first time in my life, I have to stay at home uh, even though I want to go, I really have to stay home. I've got no choice but stay home. So, uh, so 18 of March onwards until 31st of December, every provision deals with the time period. Huh? So that is the general feature of the bill. 18 of March to 31st December 2020. And for this, PAPA has been extended. Um, and the extension is up to 36 months. Yeah, 36 months. It's given extra 36 months. Next, please. Now, Insolvency. Uh, insolvency Act, uh, many years, a few years ago, uh, Parliament amended the Bankruptcy Act and the company laws pertaining to insolvency and combined everything under the Insolvency Act 1967. So, always remember, when you deal with insolvency, you are dealing with a company. When you deal with bankruptcy, we deal with a human being. Only in America, 
uh, Americans being Americans, everything is the word bankruptcy. But in England, where we are referring our laws from, uh, insolvency deals with company and bankruptcy deals with human being. Now, for those who are law, new law students here, what is insolvency and bankruptcy? Basically, you owe more money than you have. And someone is, uh, somebody filed an application in court to declare your company insolvent, therefore closing down your company, or to declare the human being bankrupt and making you a permanent bankrupt. And once you're bankrupt, you cannot do many, many things. For example, you can't travel beyond Malaysia, your passport is impounded. So now for this moment in time, for fear of people who may be unable to pay debt, uh, uh, instead of allowing any Tom, Dick and Harry to sue any Tom, Dick and Harry for bankruptcy and make the person bankrupt, the limitation, the, the quantum to trigger the right for bankruptcy has been increased from 50,000 ringgit to 100,000 ringgit. Now, what it means is that if Richard V owe money to somebody and I owe money, say, 51,000 ringgit, under the current law, that somebody can uh, apply to make me bankrupt because I was unable to pay the debt. But under this new COVID-19 law, the quantum to trigger the right to file a bankruptcy application has been increased to 100,000 ringgit. Okay? okay? So any questions, you come back later. Uh, we can discuss a bit more. Now, number six, uh, next one. This is about higher purchase. Now, what is higher purchase? For those, again, uh, I know there are many seniors here who probably have your own higher purchase. I have higher purchase. I, I purchase my cars uh, through higher purchase agreement. So, usually higher purchase deals with vehicles. Uh, you buy tractor, motorbike, ships, um, car, uh, through higher purchase. So, uh, there's a higher purchase act. Uh, this is the, and that Act of Parliament is the one which um, 1967 and this High Purchase Act 1967 is the one which will uh, govern uh, the way uh, we deal with high purchase uh, deals uh, uh, rights. So um, again, this one, uh, if a person fail uh, to take, sorry, if a person fail to pay the bank uh, the high purchase monthly installments, one of the rights of the bank is the bank can uh, take away uh, the, the item. So if let's say your car, you owe the bank three, four months in installments, the bank can send someone to uh, take possession of the car. We call it repossession. In, uh, in legal jargon, uh, or should I say in legal bahasa pasa, we call it uh, repo, repo rights, the repo rights. So under the repo rights, um, uh, you will see that um, now it's been extended. So the bank can't go and repossess the property at the moment. This is what the law says. Next, please. Ah, so Consumer Protection Act. So under Consumer Protection Act, it's a, it's a whooping act. Huh? By the way, the Consumer Protection Act 1999 has uh, 150 or 200 pages. Is a, Huge act of parliament. But uh, section 24, we, we for uh, uh, Venezuela, uh, it deals with a, the provision on the breach of contract. So basically, if I can read out what section 24, we say, default in payment of installments by purchaser. In the event of a default um, in payment of two consecutive installments by a purchaser under a credit sale agreement, the credit facility provider shall issue a notice to the purchaser on the settlement of the overdue, overdue installments. And this will, will be followed by um, uh, the right of the party who is um, the victim of the breach, the, the company, they can take action against you. But under this new uh, COVID-19 bill, that right is now basically suspended. Uh, it's been modified. And um, you, you can see uh, in the slides, it's written there, the purchaser may elect to either pay the overdue installments, make early settlement, or even terminate the agreement and surrender the purchase goods. 
Now, what are we dealing with about? Uh? This is not higher purchase. This is pertaining to, for example, um, you buy a vacuum cleaner or a television uh, and you're paying installments. So, uh, the, the, the company who, who sold the item to you can come and take back the vacuum cleaner, for example. So, this, is, this provision is dealing with that. Because I think many Malaysians out there love to buy electrical products on installments. So, that we are dealing with uh, that kind of issue. But according to this COVID-19 bill, uh, it, there is a modification to the consumer protection right. Next, please. Still on credit sales agreement, uh, credit facility providers are not allowed to commence legal proceedings. So as you can see now, uh, people who sold you your vacuum cleaner and you didn't pay your installment, they can't take any action against you for now. So happy lah, everybody now, happily using the vacuum cleaner uh, without uh, any uh, accountability. Okay, sorry, my phone rang. Now, um, back to this. Uh, let me try and I've lost. Okay. Now, um, pertaining to the next page, uh, can, I, can I get the next? Okay. Distress Act, modification to the Distress Act. Distrain for arrears of rent. Now, the first question, of course, for most of you should ask, especially those young law students, what is a distress act? This is nothing to do about being stressed. Uh, there's nothing to do about uh, you feeling upset. This stress act is where a landlord can take an action against a tenant who has not paid rent. So uh, this distress act is effectively a, uh, something like a right of seizure and uh, right of, uh, to enter the property and seize assets. This has been now, of course, suspended. Um, so basically, uh, the distress cannot be carried out at the moment, which makes sense because some people can't pay rent at the moment. Right? Next. Housing developer. Okay, housing developer. So as you know, most, there are many people buying properties all the time. And um, again, for the young budding law students, the laws pertaining to uh, buying and selling properties in Malaysia are governed by the Housing Developers uh, Act. And uh, the Housing Developers uh, Control and Licensing Act 1966 is the, the one that we are looking at at the moment. So, um, can I, again, it talks about 18 of March 2020, but this one is a bit different. It's up to a period of two years. So, this is slightly longer. Now, what, what did it modify? What did the COVID-19 bill modify? Next, please. It modified late payment charges. So, you see, when a person is purchasing a property from a developer, uh, the person will be uh, paying installments to the developer. Um, not everyone take bank loans to pay uh, the developer. Uh, but even if you take a bank loan to pay a developer, uh, during this period, that payment probably will be suspended. But the problem is that when you don't make any payment to the developer, the developer can charge you for late payment charges. Uh, but basically under the COVID-19 bill, the right to charge late payment charges have been, have been uh, basically uh, at the moment stopped. Uh, it's been deferred for now. So there you go. Uh, and if you go back earlier on, uh, when we were talking about our first, our number one, the inability to perform the contract. So the purchaser who's unable to pay uh, the monthly or the installments or whatever uh, 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 timeline imposed by the developer. So if the purchaser is unable to pay the payment as per the timeline, the, pay, the purchaser is actually in breach of contract. So the developer technically can sue the purchaser, but the purchaser is possible can take refuge under the earlier provisions of the breach of contract. Because I think it should fall within the list of uh, contracts that it governs. So as you can see, it listed down a set of uh, contracts that it can come into play. So this is how it works. For this, it's take, uh, dealing with the late payment charges, which can be imposed by the developer 
but now it's been suspended. Next issue on the housing developer. There are a few actually. Ah, so this is about VP and LD. Now, when you buy a property from a developer, developer must deliver the property to you. It's called delivery of vacant possession. And under the sale and purchase agreement between the buyer and the developer, there is already a pre-agreed damages if the developer delivers the property late. If the developer, um, uh, how should I say, um, delay for say one year, then the purchaser can take action against the developer. Uh, but it looks like under the COVID-19 bill, the developer uh, escapes from this for now. Uh, they, they, they're not liable because the developer is unable to deliver the vacant possession in time. Uh, their workers cannot work. The developer's workers cannot work. Construction cannot complete. People cannot move around. Yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and some of the items are, for example, uh, imported from overseas to complete the property. And it's very difficult to bring overseas items into Malaysia at the moment. So all this taken into account, the COVID-19 bill seems to uh, regulate this area now. And it suggests that the property developer can seek refuge under this uh, proviso uh, so that they are not sued by the purchaser. Hmm? Next one, please. Now, what is a DLP? So, defective liability period. Still, this is still under housing developer. A eh? lot of property issues on housing developer. Now, again, um, when, when, when you purchase a property, uh, the property is delivered to you. So, the developer gives you the key to your, your condo, your house. You open the door. You open the door and then you find that the, the tiles are all broken. So then you can sue the developer or demand that the de developer uh, repair. And in every sale and purchase agreement with the developer, there is a defective liability period. So colloquially, among we lawyers, we call it DLP. So during the DLP period, defective liability period, uh, if the purchaser finds anything defective, you can demand that the, the, the contractor of the developer repair it. But can they repair it now? Uh, for example, so the last two months not so bad because the MCO has been relaxed, so it can be repaired. But the early months of the MCO was very bad. We can't move anything at all. So again, uh, uh, Parliament is uh, creating this uh, protection uh, to give the developer time uh, to repair this. And at the same time, to allow the purchaser to extend so you can still sue even after the defective liability period. So let's say your DLP period seemed to have ended around this time. It seems that you can still claim after that. That is what has been interpreted so far. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say one thing before I continue, right? Everything that I've said to you so far, are our interpretation. We haven't seen parliament passing this act yet. And I wouldn't be surprised I may have to hold another <laughs> webinar if it turns out the entire bill change, you know, uh, I hope not. Uh, but from the wordings written in the bill, this is what we have interpreted. Uh, and I stand corrected, of course. I hope we are not wrong, uh, but I'm quite optimistic that our interpretation is quite accurate. So there you go for now. Next. Ah, this is an employment law matter. So under employment law, there are a few Act of Parliaments in Malaysia dealing with employment. Uh, RWC, we do a fair bit of employment law work. That's another area of work that we do, which people don't know. Um, so, for employment matters, if your salary is above 2,500 ringgit and your employer sacked you or retrenched you or wrongfully dismissed you, then because your salary is above 2,500 ringgit, your remedy uh, lies in two courts. One is the normal court, uh, Makama Session, Makama Tinggi, depending on your salary, you can sue for breach of contract, blah, blah, blah. So your remedy lies your breach of contract. 
But the employment law, particularly this Industrial Relation Act, has a specific tribunal created for employees. And that tribunal is called the Industrial Court. This Industrial Court has got nothing to do with industry. Eh? So industry, build things, build cars. No, the word industrial means working. So this Industrial Relations Act created the Industrial Relations the, uh, Court. In order for a, an employee to take an action at the industrial court, there is a time period, a limitation period. So you can see here, uh, the period again has been extended. So, so some uh, uh, employees, for example, they lost their job in January or February. Uh, so that means no, nothing to do with MCO. They, they were either relieved of their duty, they were retrenched, or they were dismissed. So they were very angry. They want to sue the employer. Then while they were preparing the paper to file <laughs> the paper in industrial court, 18 of March came in and the court was closed. They couldn't file. And they have, for example, six months or six weeks or three weeks. Because it depends. A different, different scenario have a different, different limitation period. So let's say for retrenchment, if you want to file a, a complaint at the industrial relation, you have uh, three months, when? three months, right? You've got three months to, to file a, a complaint. And your, your three-month period happened to fall within the MCO. So in the Malaysian Chinese, we say, die law, how to file? Die. You know, Malaysian favorite, anything wrong, die. I don't know why, everything die, you know. So die law, cannot file, you know. So this act of, uh, this COVID-19 bill allows you to revive it. You can still file. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. This is a good thing, right? So uh, basically, this is a, uh, as I said earlier in the Malay phrase, mati hidup semula. So you are back, you are revived uh, again. Yeah. Okay? Next, please. Thank you. So this is the, the Private Employment Agency Act 1981. Uh, this again deals about the uh, renewal of license. Uh, basically, it's extension of renewal license. Same thing. So any license period expiring at time, you're not allowed to renew it even after that time. Okay, so you won't be punished for having your renewal period falling within the MCO. Now you can still renew it afterwards. Okay, as you can see, you can see the theme of the bill. The entire bill is about that. So if you, you, if you kaput during the time, you, they bring you back alive. If you want to sue, you can't sue, you can sue now. You know, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's basically, that is the, the character of the bill. Hmm? Next, please. Now, this is the Land Public Transport Act. This deals with buses, taxis, uh, public transports. And like any other public transport, these public vehicles, they need licenses. And the licenses, again, may have expired during the COVID-19 uh, MCO. So, once again, it, you, the period has been extended. You can now uh, go again and file an uh, application for licensing. This is, again, a very simplified... I'm, I'm simplifying it for all of you. It's a lot more detailed. And there's a lot of... Uh, uh, just like the earlier one on um, uh, employment law, no, there's, there are many deal, details, but I'm giving you the principle for purposes of understanding what the bill is about. That's number 11. And then the last one, number 12, is the most interesting one. Uh, again, this is a modification to the Commercial Vehicle Licensing Board. Uh, basically, again, when it comes to licensing, the period has been extended. Okay, so this is number 11, the 11th amendment, 11th area of amendment, which is about commercial vehicles. Okay? Uh, chok, sorry, sorry. This deals, there's an effect on insurance, huh, by the way. So you can see at the bottom there, there's issue of insurance. So some of the insurance expired, now it may have to be extended. So the insurance, as you know, uh, is latched on to the, uh, the permit of the vehicle. So again, for the young budding law students here, law is not just about offer and acceptance, color against public smoke balls, Donahue and Stevenson, Wilmington, DPP. You need to know all that. That, is, that one you must, must, must know to get your basics. You cannot start running 100 meter if you cannot walk. You cannot swim 100 meter race if you can't even float on the water. 
So everything you need to have basic. Your basic is Wolvington, Caparo, Dickman, uh, Carlisle. But this, what I'm teaching you is the realities of law, regulations, governance, uh, rules, licensing. And this is where we lawyers come in to give advice. We deal with this work every day. Um, so uh, the COVID-19 bill is actually have, uh, has, has impact on legal services because as a lawyer, we would have to uh, deal with these problems with our, uh, for our clients. If, if I have a client who own a fleet of buses, so this issue of the commercial vehicle licensing board will be important for my client. Okay? So learn your basics in school, listen to your teachers, they're teaching you all your Carlisle, Carbolic, Wolbington, DPP, blah, blah, blah. But eventually, you, when you understand the concept of invitation to treat, your concept of um, uh, this uh, enforceable contract or non-enforceable contract, warranty, condition, blah, 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 then that concept comes into play for these bills. Then you understand why we have all these licensing rules, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Hmm? Next, please. Um, yep, same thing. So basically, the licenses are all uh, extended. I, I won't go into detail this. Thank you. Ah, the last one. The last one, number 12, this deals with the power of uh, the courts. So in Malaysia, there are two acts of parliaments. There, there are many, many acts of parliaments dealing with courts. But these two are the imperial acts of parliaments. The first is the Courts of Judicature Act, which deals with the creation of the High Court, the Court of Appeal, the Federal Court. Uh, so this act, of this act of parliament governs these three courts. So you want to know why you sue there, where you sue, blah, and the quantum of the suit is because of this Act of Parliament. So this Act of Parliament now has been amended to give the, our Chief Justice, which at the moment is a, is a lady, first, uh, first uh, power to the ladies, uh, the first lady to become a CJ. So, you know, all you girls out there, uh, just because a man tell you you can't do it, tell him to fly kites, you know, because a, a woman can become a Chief Justice, you know. Don't let any man bully you. I always tell my daughter that. So, um, in this case, uh, the Chief Justice, she can now uh, extend certain powers under this act. I'll, I'll go to the next slide after this. The other act of parliament which is important is the Subordinate Court Act, which deals with the lower courts, the magistrates, the small claim court, the sessions court, all. That's a Subordinate Court Act. So when you come into a practice and become a lawyer like Wendy and me, you need to know these two acts of parliaments in Malaysia. Hmm? So for here, you can see that uh, under Section 16A, um, there's, a, there's an issue where the Chief Justice is given power uh, to amend the way we run our court hearing based on these issues, public safety, public health, public security. Next, please. Yeah, so the powers of Chief Justice can adjourn any uh, meeting when it's not possible to be held. Um, uh, you can also uh, require for an annual meeting also to be dispensed with. Uh, they, uh, they added in a new section 17.8 which allowed the Chief Justice to modify any provision in the rules of court, etc. Uh, etc. Et now, what is the rules of court? Now, when you become a lawyer, uh, especially when you carry out litigation services, there, there is one particular book called the Rules of Court. The Rules of Court do we have it there? No, don't have it. The Rules of Court 19, uh, 2012 is um, uh, basically the, the, the Bible or the Quran, depending on what religion you are, of uh, court matters. So this is how the book looks like. So uh, okay, I'm going to block this page because it's from a rival university. So this is the Rules of Court. Okay, This Rule of Court 1912, 2012 you see how thick the book is? So all of us lawyers, and if those who are doing CLP and all that, we need to memorize this. We need to understand this. It will tell us where to file, how, what to file, um, uh, how to conduct a trial, uh, how, what can you put in your affidavits, um, application for discovery, case management, appeals, costs, etc. It's all in this rules of court. So now, according to the new... Um, uh, bill, the COVID-19 bill, our Chief Justice, her, Lord, her ladyship, her ladyship now can modify the rules uh, depending on the 
interest of the case. So for a long time, we were, as a lawyer, we were struggling to deal with uh, the COVID-19 because the rules did not expressly state that we can hold hearings online. So, uh, and then we have a problem. How, how do you cross-examine a person online? You know, I mean, if I'm good, normally cross-examination is about the element of surprise, uh, the, the art of um, questioning a person to the point where the person have to concede certain issues. But if the witness is sitting in his or her house and has all the notes, you see like this video, you can only see my face here. You have no idea whether I'm hiding notes here. You know, or maybe someone is sitting next to me here now and whispering to me and answer. You can't see, you know. So we had that problem and I think that will still be an ongoing problem. I, I doubt we can do a trial, uh, especially criminal trial online. But there have been some cases, I understand, uh, which has been conducted online trial. Uh, I'm not sure how the lawyers go around the issue of cross-examination, but apparently it was successfully done. I, I, I suspect there were a lot of um, safeguards before the trial could be conducted uh, online. So anyway, the point is now, uh, the new COVID-19 bill, if passed by parliament, if passed by parliament, have empowered the chief justice so that her ladyship can uh, amend the rules uh, and laws uh, with regards to our, the way we litigate matters. Now, this is very important for lawyers. Very, very, very important. And, um, and also, many, many people don't realize that because of COVID-19, the criminal courts could not move. And there are many accused persons in Malaysia, we call them OKT. Uh, it's a short form for Orang Kena Tuduh. Uh, OKT, in English, the books are usually referring to them as the accused person. So, uh, but because we are Malaysia, let's use the Malaysian term OKT. So the OKT is stuck in prison because there are many instances where the OKT cannot get bail. And some crimes are even worse, it's unbailable. So if it's unbailable, you cannot get bail even if you want to. For example, capital crimes like murder, drugs, uh, robbery. So if you're charged for those offenses, you can't get bail. So it's very funny, we have this innocent until proven guilty, but you can't get bail. So that, that's, that's law. And then some cases are non-bailable or bailable. So when you're non-bailable, the presumption is you cannot get bail unless you apply. And in some cases, the accused person, the OKT, applied, but failed. Failed to get bail. So that person, he or she, is still stuck in prison. Trial cannot proceed. So the person is just sitting there waiting for trial to start. And at the same time, you can't conduct a criminal trial online. <coughs> the person's liberty is at stake. You need to prove, as a defense counsel, some element of reasonable doubt to trigger Wilmington and DPP so that the court is persuaded to acquit the person. How do you do that? when you need to cross-examine a witness through video, then the DPP, the Dep Deputy Public Prosecutor, need to prosecute the case and prove beyond reasonable doubt that the person is guilty. How is the DPP going to do that? Through, through online video. So th 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 this is something for us to see. In fact, my friends who are mostly doing criminal defense cases, I, I, I kind of, I've stopped doing criminal defense cases for a few years now. My last... Uh, case was uh, in 20, 2016 when I did a drug case, two drug cases. That was my last case since then. So I, when I spoke to my friends who are lawyers who are doing uh, criminal defense work, they are heavily objecting to online hearings. So that is something we still wait to see how it develops. So uh, next please. I think that's the end, I think.
uh, same thing, the subordinate court act, same, same, like the first one. So this is the other act of parliament I told you, which is very important. So under the subordinate courts act, the CJ can then make amendments to allow hearings online, etc., etc. There you go. Yeah, so that's the end. That's the end of our what I would like. I've, I've tried to modify it and make it as simple as possible for everybody here. I, I can see some of the people who log in are, are the law lecturers, which makes me a bit more nervous to speak to law lecturers. I mean, most of the time, the law lecturers are far more better than me uh, in their areas of what they're teaching in. So I, I can expect some probing and difficult questions later. Uh, but uh, I've tried my best to, uh, we have tried our best to uh, present this in a simple way uh, to make people understand. If uh, I repeat, when you're free, please have a look at the articles, uh, either at RWC website or the many other articles written by my other members of the bar, uh, and you can have a look at it. So can I open it to Q&A, please? Thank you, Mr. Wee, for the enlightening talk. I believe that all of us have indeed gained some valuable insight on the legal impact of the COVID-19 bill. Now we shall answer the questions from the floor. To all attendees, you may still submit your questions via the chat box. Do remember to include your name and state whether you would like to ask your question live. Can we switch off the share screen? Uh, please, sorry. Thank you very much, um, uh, Puan Susana. Thank you. Sorry to make you my clicker. Sorry, uh. sorry, Mr. Ma. <laughs> no <laughs> problem. I, yeah. Terima kasih, terima kasih. So, okay. Um, now that I see everyone's face again, I just realized... 92 people are on board. Ah. Oh my God. I hope I didn't say anything wrong. Okay. All right. Yeah, we, had about, we had about 100. Oh my God. Today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, supporting this uh, event uh, by Taylor's. Thank you. I hope I didn't let you all down. Um, sometimes uh, as a speaker on a webinar, it's very hard to gauge how the uh, attendees feel. You know, when you go to talk, you go to the stage, you, look, you, you are speaking. From the look of the face, you know really whether they, they agree with you or they connect with you. Here, it's virtually impossible. Sometimes when I'm giving a webinar, I truly feel that I'm talking to myself. So, uh, Hello. You know, yeah. So, okay. I, I, uh, any Q&A? I'm open to any Q&A. Richard, yes. my name is Harshara. Hi, Harshara. I, I dare not show you my face because I'm not terribly well dressed. Okay, but I can see your, uh, your <laughs> handsome photo. Thank you. That's a very old one. Huh? <laughs> I no, assume I you are a lecturer there, Mr. Acharan. I hope I should think so. <laughs> I should hope so. But anyway, okay, I'm sir. still learning the law, and I, I really want to say that I appreciate what you've done th uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, for me, too, uh, it was very informative. And um, I hope that if and when this bill does get passed, yeah, uh, you could come over and maybe again tell us, maybe a year <laughs> from now, how really uh, yeah. things happened. Huh? You know what, Hacharan? I, I, we suspect, my firm suspect that there will be amendments. There, there will, will be. be some amendments. I, I think it's inevitable. Like, you know, they have to have it. Because so, they can't uh, rely on the state of the law as it is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the bill also, to be frank, wasn't that well drafted. It really looked like a cut and paste from Singapore. Very <laughs> strange for our government, especially this current government. The earlier government was quite friendly with Singapore. This mm. current, current government is not very friendly with Singapore, but mm. very conveniently they have seemed to have taken about I think 30-40% from Singapore's bill. They should have followed what England and Singapore did where we have done the COVID-19 bill at the beginning of the MCO. Not, not now, but we all know what happened in March. So let's not go into that topic. Lah. Then always they accuse us of being political. So, um, yeah. So sadly for Malaysians, we suffer due to politics. So, okay, Richard, I wanted to thank you very much. I'm not going to take up any more time here because I'm sure there, are, uh, there will be questions that will be asked. Thank you once again, Richard. Cheers. Come over to my office one day. Yes, once the RMCO is... It's lifted totally. Yeah, man. We, I, I think we, we should host a barbecue for Taylor's Studio Steel. Huh? Bring them over, yeah. Because we, we are operating from a big bungalow. We rented a big bungalow for events and we can't do anything for the last six months. Ah, <laughs> uh, mati lah. 
Okay. Well, you know what, what they say, man proposes, God disposes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, Mr. Richard, we have yes. one question from Mimisha. So mm. she asks, what do you personally think is something essential that is missing from the COVID-19 bill? Well, I think, um, frankly, um, the, in terms of principle and in terms of areas which is governed, um, the, the bill seems to have governed the essential commercial issues. Many commercial issues which have massive impact to the way we run our business uh, has been covered. So, for example, the Consumer Protection Act, the extension of the uh, Employment Act, etc., etc., is um, is welcome. Uh, but I do notice that there are some areas which has not been um, addressed. So, for example, um, uh, what about issues related? Uh, to uh, criminal matters, as I just mentioned, uh, not really address the criminal defense cases. Uh, we cannot always assume that the person who's been arrested is guilty. Uh, Malaysian by nature, we assume the person is guilty. Most of the time they are, you know, especially if they are stealing lots and lots of money from the government, then we can assume that they are guilty. But uh, the, the prevailing uh, concept of innocent until proven guilty will always apply. So we're not very sure how that will work. Uh, maybe another area I can address too is about issues of um, uh, uh, child law, a children's law. Um, you know, during during the uh, COVID nineteen, there was a lot of domestic violence. Um, uh, we, we many, of course, as usual, is unreported. And then while the two adults may be fighting, I I, I have my I'm going to reserve my comments about the two adults fighting either boyfriend and boyfriend, girlfriend and girlfriend, or boyfriend and girlfriend, husband and wife, whatever, you know. Um, but what about the children who have been affected? Uh, there's not enough protection for the children. Um, I've heard from comments from the child rights laws that they would have preferred more protection for the kids. To be frank, I'm not very sure what kind of protection they're looking at. I don't really practice defense of child law. Uh, but... I can understand what they mean by the issues of domestic violence. So that, that could be another area. I would, I would, but I would think generally the COVID-19 bill is fairly all right. Could have been better, but it's not too bad. Any other question? No more, huh? And I think all very shy to ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, to all attendees, you may still submit your questions via the chat box. And if you want to do so, do remember to include your name and state whether you want to ask your question live. Are you, all, are you attending classes face to face or all your classes are still online? Oh, um, actually, some of our classes are online, um, live synchronously, and some of our classes are pre-recorded. So I we see. can watch them anytime we want. Okay, cool. I got a question I see here from Lai Yu Yi. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know after the government waives these late payments or encourages lower payment, what should they do to help the owner when they're helping the tenant? Okay, there's a few questions you're asking there, uh, Yu Yi. Now, with regards to the uh, the owner of the the landlord owner, this this is how I think the government is looking at it, lah. Huh? Okay, if you are the owner of a property, at the moment you can't distress, so that means you can't go and get back the property under the, the distress act. Number one, number two, the tenant who is in breach for not paying rent also apparently now can get protection. Number three, the the tenant also apparently now uh, can ask for other protection under the COVID-19. But what about the owner? Because the owner uh, has a property but lost a lot of things. So this is how I think they look at it. Number one, if the landlord, the owner, owes money to the bank, but because there is a moratorium now, the owner doesn't have to pay the bank any money anyway. So therefore, there is little impact on the owner of the property. 
number one. Number two, uh, I think the owner will always have something which a tenant don't have when it comes to property law, which is the owner owns the property. The tenant can do whatever they want, but the property owned, is owned by the landlord. So balancing that, I think that's why the, the, the bill seems to lean to protect the tenant as compared to protecting the owner because the owner naturally have inbuilt and inherent powerful rights already. That's what I suspect. Uh, and being a landowner myself, I, I own a, my, my house. I, I'll be quite upset if my tenant don't pay me my rent. Uh, but, you know, I will always have the, the house. Whereas the tenant, you know, um, has nowhere else to go. So I think this, this is a give and take situation. Uh, not an ideal and perfect scenario. Uh, but I, eventually, I think things will, will equalize by itself. That's how I look at it. So I don't think uh, um, that the, they're not helping the owner because the owner already have help at the moment, I, I think. I'm, I'm not here, by the way, I'm not pro-tenant or pro-owner. I'm just giving you an objective view on this. Ken? Next one is uh, Chia Kelvin, yes, Sabah. And he asks is if, since there is a new cluster in Sabah, do you think the government should come up with any bill to control this situation? especially when the election will be held soon. For example, well, you know, Kelvin, uh, I would have to beg to defer to have a specialized uh, bill for any particular cluster because a cluster can happen anytime. And usually clusters happen because we have uh, really, sorry to say, irresponsible, uh, sometimes silly people who think that's all right. Right, so uh, this, this, this is the problem clusters. Somebody did something and came back from somewhere. Uh, I, I noticed always some kanduri, some travels, uh, then boom, cluster. And like one, the, 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 the Kedah guy came back, went to a restaurant, boom, one more cluster. So I don't think it's about the bill. I think the current actions taken by the health ministry is sufficient. And we cannot have a bill to govern every cluster at the moment. Uh, but but maybe we can have a law to govern um, irresponsible spread of uh, um, virus. We have, at the moment, sufficient laws on that point. We have laws which say if somebody purposely spread a disease, it can be, you, you can be charged in court, but maybe that law can be enhanced to impose a more uh, relevant punishment to reflect the current um, current atmosphere. Uh, I think all of us are quite concerned when we have an idiot walking around with a pandemic, uh, with a virus, and not wearing a mask. Uh, that, that, that's uh, so what I notice. Ken? Yes. And then, uh, and we have a question from Chong Ler Yi regarding the Distress Act. If the owner now raises the rent and in a way forces tenants to leave, can the tenants sue the owner? Well, this is a good question. Uh, um, what's your name? Uh, Si Le, okay? Chong Le Yi. Chong Le Yi, okay. Yeah. Chong Le Yi. Good question, Lee. But um, when it comes to landlord and tenant increasing rental, it is an offer and acceptance situation. It's a contractual issue. Um, of course, the tenant may complain, oh, yo, you're terrible, la, landlord. You know, you're bullying me, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but just a few years ago, uh, many tenants were bullying landlord. They rent an apartment, they find another apartment cheaper, they don't pay rental for two months, and then they just disappear and go to the other, uh, uh, the, the other uh, what they call this apartment. And then worse, some of these tenants, they destroy the house, they destroy the toilet. I don't know why they love destroying toilets. Then uh, the landlord having to spend lots of money to repair the property. We also have many of these kind of cases. So not all landlords are bad people. Uh, and not all tenants are good people. You know? So to answer your question, I don't think the tenant can sue the landlord for that. It is really for the tenant to, to negotiate with the owner. And if the rental is too expensive, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, move out. It, because it's the landlord's right. Unless, of course, that landlord's property is governed by some sort of a rent control act. If there's a rent control law on that property, uh, then correct. Lah. The landlord cannot simply increase rental. Lah. 
you know. But if it's just a normal office, normal factory, normal shop, normal house, it's up to the landlord. And the landlord is very, so very silly. Any, actually, if you ask me, any landlord now, increasing rental is stupid. Because you immediately lose the tenant, your property is empty. So better to have someone there renting than nobody renting there. So that's the other practical scenario. Lah. So I, I, I don't think suing the landlord or the owner may be a visible or viable uh, uh, solution. It may happen. Uh, but at the same time, I think the tenant and landlord can negotiate. And I do hope the landlord could, don't be so uh, unreasonable. Lah. Hmm? I hope I answered the question. Next question. Oh, Thank suddenly you, got so many questions. Very good. Yeah, very good. Next. The next one is from Josephine. She asks, just to clarify, does Section 24 of the CJA 1964 enables the High Court to conduct hearings online as it states, have all the powers? Um, section 25 of the... Is it, is it Section 24 or 25 of the Courts of Judicature Act? 25. 25. Okay. Under the Courts of Judicature Act, basically at the moment, there is no positive uh, uh, mention of an online hearing at the moment. None. So the only way is to creatively interpret uh, the Court of Judicature Act to allow the online hearing. But courts won't simply interpret it that way because courts are very traditional. Uh, Look at us, look at all of us, uh, lawyers, law students. You are studying a case, Color Against Public Smoke Mall is my favorite one. That happened a few hundred years ago, hundred over years ago. The lawyers were still riding horses. There were no photocopy machine. There were no mobile phone, no Google, no nothing, no WhatsApp, nothing at the time. right? Uh, but we're still studying those cases. So courts by nature are very traditional. So... I would dare say that's why courts were very slow to interpret the word have all the powers to include online hearing. But now, this COVID-19 is empowering the CJ, courts, uh, the Chief Justice, to do whatever her leadership thinks is right. So that may pave the way for us to finally have a more robust online hearing. I, I'm personally uh, in support of the online hearing. I think some hearings can be done online. For example, probate uh, or joint petition for divorce. Uh, you don't need to bring the two husband and wife who hate each other to go to court to get a joint petition divorce. It can, it can be done online for joint petition. Lah. If it's contested, cannot. You know? There are some applications in court where it's just purely lawyer's work where we attend case management or we submit documents in court, we uh, handle an inquiry from court, uh, or the judge uh, 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 want the lawyer to clarify certain matters in the documents. All that can be done online. We don't need to do it face-to-face. Uh, -face. So I, I welcome uh, the, uh, the advent uh, of online hearings, but I think the court also has to be very cautious and careful can't just simply open everything up that way. Lah. So, we respect, uh, I think your question, good question, but I think um, this uh, current bill allows uh, the CJ more power, which may include having hearings online. Hmm? Ken? Boleh? And we have one last question from uh, Mr. Hacharan. He'd yes. like to ask the question himself. Yes. Oh, yours, Mr. Achar? Oh, I'm okay. So, sorry, uh, Richard. I'm, I sometimes find it difficult to unmute myself. I don't know where to look for the button. So anyway, I found it. I just wanted to uh, confirm with you and this powers that have been given to the Chief Justice mm. to uh, change the method of uh, uh, hearing if necessary. Uh, is it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's temporary, is it not? Um, it looks like it is temporary because uh, the amendments uh, of the Courts of Judicature Act is done by this bill. And this bill apparently will only last for two years. So okay. it looks like it's temporary. 
But I would not be surprised that later on, if the, for example, let, let's, let's travel to the future, two years from now, and um, the Chief Justice, her leadership, have now carried out all kinds of online hearings, and the public, the lawyers, uh, have embraced it, they like it, and I would not be surprised that um, it, may, it may stay on. Uh, the Chief Justice may apply to, to the to Parliament or to court to the to the Attorney General to pass a bill that this may be a permanent amendment. But if you look at the way the insertion of that provision into the court of judicature is done, and you look at the source of the power of the insertion at the opening of the bill, it says very clearly that this bill only will survive for two years. So to answer your question, I think it should be temporary lah for now. Thank you. Actually, the reason I had to ask you the question was because I came in late. So I obviously missed your first slide. Oh, no, this, I, to be fair, I didn't address the issue at all. The, your question is, uh, I think the first time everyone here is listening to it. So okay. uh, yeah, I think it's going to be temporary. Because I have some concerns about uh, giving white powers to any one person. <laughs> I'm so cynical. I do not believe anyone is wise enough to have such white, uh, white yep. yep. And our country have just re seen it uh, over the years, how oh, one person getting too much power has caused. So, what, what did Lord, Lord Acton say? Absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? That, that, that infamous or that famous phrase, yeah. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Yeah. It's so true, so true, yeah. Thank you, Richard. Cheers. And that's the end of the question and answer session. Ah, Thank okay. you for all the questions, everyone. And now we will move on to our photo taking session. So if everyone can switch on your cameras, please. Wait, uh, hold on. Uh, let me put some um, makeup first. Uh, sorry. Eugene, I have to decline. <laughs> Nobody wants to see my bald face. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> this good looking photograph of mine should hopefully is good enough. And we'll have Daphne to screenshot. Okay, just a second, yeah. Everyone smile. Everyone smile. Three, two, one. And another one. Three, two, one. Okay, that's all. Thank you. It's so strange, la, man. I never <laughs> thought we would take a group photo this way, you know. All a change of behavioral pattern. So anyway, Taylor, can I thank you again, Mr. Harmahinda? Terima kasih. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, sorry, I was uh, um, in and out of different calls. I, I couldn't really say anything at the start. I'm so sorry about that. No worries, uh, thank you very much for your time and for, and for giving us that very informative uh, uh, breakdown. Uh, of the COVID-19 bill. Uh, and uh, I would like to echo what Mr. Hacharan has said that uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, bring you back uh, to give us an overview once this is passed, hopefully, at that point. So thank you okay, again, okay. Richard, uh, okay. and we'll definitely see you soon. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you, Richard. Richard. To, all the, to all the students, study hard. Huh? All right, bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you.